that your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, everybody is well, uh, surviving, doing well in these uh, lockdown conditions worldwide. Everybody's affected directly or indirectly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep everybody safe and secure and keep uh, hardships away from everyone. And if we are faced with hardship, may Allah make us steadfast through them and not complain. So let us make a start. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Qala Allah tabarak wa ta'ala fi cha'ni habibihi mukbiran wa amira inna Allah wa malaikatahu salluna ala nabi ya ayuhal ladhina amanu salli alihi wa sallim wa taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ummati wa jma'in Salatun salam alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah Salatun salam alayka ya Sayyidi ya Habibullah Alhamdulillah, we have been through 20 ajza, 20 parts of the Noble Quran in this journey through the Quran with our asatis of our teachers, the Imam, the Shuru, um, the those people who give us uh, the inheritance that comes from the Prophets. So this knowledge is the inheritance of the Prophets, especially knowledge of the Deen. Going through the Quran, you see this is uh, the month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran. And it is an ideal time for ourselves to reconnect with the Quran if we have uh, weakened that connection at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allow us to do that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability and the strength uh, to go through that. So Alhamdulillah, 20 Ajza, 20 Juz we have been through with various teachers and scholars. And Saturday, yesterday we had a female teacher as well. Alhamdulillah, you know, these, these are the blessings of the month of Ramadan. And Alhamdulillah, on the platform of Minhaj College, um subhanallah we're getting so much and inshallah with everybody's support we will continue to provide such quality content and such quality knowledge and education to the masses um as much as we possibly can and this all depends on the uh, uh, on your feedback as well and how we can improve and also on how many people are supportive of uh, of the college itself in high college alhamdulillah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I will be today going through Jews number 21 today, 21st night, 21st night of Ramadan Mubarak. Many people have started the Yatikaf. Those where the masjids are open around the world, which are very few people, the men have gone into the, those masjids uh, for Yatikaf, uh, religious seclusion. And the women at home, many places, um, people have sent me, asking me all day long about fit issues regarding that for women. Uh, they have uh, adopted uh, religious seclusion, Yatikaf in their homes as well today so we need to only contact them if they need anything or to ask them to make dua for all of us may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their itikaf and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all their prayers and all their supplications and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep everybody safe so inshallah we should be going through just in 21 on the slide i mean the slides are up and there's also the a link that's on the uh, in class conversation board where you can download the slides from so as before, as we've done before as well, there's going to be quickly a brief introduction and then there's going to be topics in Juice 21 are going to be discussed over three slides, I think. And what we can learn from Juice 21, I think that is also a three you know, three slides and a breakdown of Juice 21, that's I think five slides and some first in Juice 21 discussed probably four slides. And then the central theme of Jews 21, inshallah, just on one slide, inshallah. So going on to slide number two, this is the first slide where we gain some knowledge regarding Jews number 21. So Jews 21, it starts at Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 45. Ankabut, we know, it means spider. In this particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that in the Ahwan al buyut al Await Al-Ankabut, that's the place where spider is mentioned in Surah Al-Ankabut. That the weakest of houses, the flimsiest of houses, is the house of uh, the spider. So the spider's house is the weakest house. Okay, so and it breaks very easily. And then we have Surah Al-Hazab, combined forces. That is where the surah ends. That is Surah number thirty-three, verse thirty. So it comprises in all, all in all, Jews twenty-one, Surah Al-Ankabut, which is uh, Surah number twenty-nine. Uh, up to verse 69 of that verse, which is the end of Surah Al-Ankabut. And then it goes into Surah Al-Rum, which means Romans, uh, which is uh, Surah number 30. And it has 60 verses. Then Surah Al-Luqman, which, which is Surah number 31. It has 34 verses. Then Surah Al-Sajda, which is Surah number 32. It has 30 verses. And then Surah Al-Ahzab, 
combined forces, which is surah number 33, up to verse 30 only. Okay, and then after that, uh, Jews number 22 will start. So Jews 21 is a total of 179 verses of the Quran, combining, going through all these uh, five surahs. So also it has, among the, we have 14 uh, sajdas in the Quran, 14 sajdas, and of those 14 sajdas, sajda number nine is in this particular Jews, and that is at 32.15, 32nd surah, verse number 15. And in total, this Jews has 19.3 rukus. In other words, 19 rukus and three ayat. Moving on from there, the topics that this Jews talks about, Okay, first and foremost, in this Jews, there are five separate chapters that are mentioned. There's, so there's, there are a lot of chapters. And as we get further on, now it's going to get more and more difficult. I must warn some of you, okay? Some of the scholars, they're going to start speeding up a little bit because there's a lot of content in a small, in a short duration within, um, you know, ayat of each other rather. There's going to be lots of new content, new information coming through uh, because these ayat, these, uh, sorry, these surahs are shorter. In these end uh, ajaza, end portions of the Quran. So there's going to be a lot to take in. Uh, so uh, as we can see here, five, five chapters, five surahs in Surah in uh, uh, Juz number 21. So we have Surah Al Ankabu, Surah Al Rum, Surah Al Luqman, Surah Al Sajda, and Surah Al Ahzab as well. And some of the important verses in this Juz are that Allah prophesied the defeat of the Romans and then their victory. This is in Surah Al Rum. Surah Al Rum. Okay, talking about the Romans. That they are going to be defeated or they have been defeated and that they will uh, be victorious very soon. So also mentions through the council or the advice of Luqman, which summarizes the requirements of faith. What is our faith? The model and model conduct. How should we be conducting ourselves with the people? And also the various verses in Surah Al-Ahzab dealing with aspects of social reorganization in respect of family and communal life. So Surah Al-Azab is very significant, uh, as well as Surah Al-Nisa. If you, if you uh, study them together, uh, you can get, the scholars say, you can get the about 90% of the laws and of the dealings and of the rules and of the, uh, the conduct procedures regarding uh, family and society. And then uh, having patience in all adverse situations is the quality of true believers. True believers, they will all do sabr. They will always turn away. You know, in the Bible it says, turn the other cheek. So true believers, they always turn the other cheek. They will very rarely, they will, unless uh, it is the greater good is to, to compete, they will not compete. Okay, they will just, just go with us, just mind their own business. Like uh, according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that for the beauty, the beautiful aspect of anyone in Islam. So one becomes Muslim and to beautify that, what does it do? What doesn't concern him, he leaves it. Mind your own business is what this hadith is saying. So uh, Muslims, they are very uh, patient. Okay, so patience is their quality. So when certain things happen, they will evaluate, should I take part in this particular confrontation or shall I just walk away? Most of the times they will just walk away. Most of the times, okay. But it depends. It depends on the, the, the question at that time um, and the situation and the circumstances. As well. And it is, and then it says, and it is the hypocrites who cannot control themselves. Well, of course, the hypocrites, you know what they do? They would always want to have the upper hand. They always want to have the last say. They always want to say, see, I shut him up. That is a quality of a hypocrites. They don't care what they say as long as they have the last say. They don't care what they do as long as they are the one who is the doing the last thing. They don't care how many people are hurt. They don't care how many people are, um, you know, face uh, damages. They don't care about anybody else's feelings in this regard. All they want is the upper hand. Okay, so it is the hypocrites who cannot control themselves. They have to win all the time. They lose the bad losers. And sometimes they're even bad winners as well. They'll win and even then they'll be known. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inviting the believer, the disbelievers to Islam and the Quran. So this is a theme that goes throughout the Quran, but is specific in Jews 21 as well. And then it says the status of the Prophet sallam, and his noble wives. And here it mentions that the noble wives of the Prophet sallam, are the mothers of all the believers. They are our mothers. They are our Ummahatul Mu'mini. 
they are our mothers. Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she is our mother. Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she is our mother. Sayyidah Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she is our mother. All the Azwaj Mutahrat are our uh, mothers. And what else? Uh, okay, then and then we go on to what can we learn from this Jews? Many things, of course, with the Quran. We learn so much from one ayah. This is an entire Jews. Prayer can assist us in becoming better people individually and also collectively. So individually and also collectively. So it's a, a communal thing. Look at verse number uh, twenty nine point four five. Okay, if if you have the the time, I mean the, the reference is there. Uh, we and then it says we are commanded to debate with the people of the book in the best of ways. In the best of ways, in the best way. So uh, don't we don't debate with them in such a way to put them off or to make them move away or to defeat them in a debate. You know, look, see, I I, I defeated him in a debate. No, we do. We should not have any of that. We should have not have any of those types of beliefs or any of those, that type of conduct. Our conduct should be one of acceptance uh, a warm welcoming conduct like you're asking me a question i'll give you an answer but according to your level that you can understand but when it comes to the people of the book they are already there they already believe in la ilaha illallah it's only muhammad rasulullah that aspect that is where we need to bring them in they only already believe in sayna musa kalimullah they already believe in sayna isa ruh but it is Muhammad Rasulullah, that little bit. So they are already half there. They already believe in La ilaha illallah. It's up to us and how we deal with them. And then he said, consider also then how we debate with one another. So if we are to be debate in a good, noble, and um, a very polite manner with people of the book, imagine how we should be debating or discussing things or even inviting each other to discussion among ourselves, among the Muslims. So this is in 29.46. And also the defeat of the Byzantine, Byzantines or the Eastern European Empire. You see the Roman Empire was later split into two. There was the Eastern and there was the Western. So the Eastern Roman Empire, which is known as the Byzantium, and the Byzantines, uh, they lost a war. And um, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that they will gain victory and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who helps. So he is the one who helped them. And that is in the... Um, Surah al Rum verses 1 to 5. We'll come to that inshallah. And then we go on to the second part of what can we learn from this Jews? The call to contemplate Allah's signs in creation. Allah keeps saying throughout this particular Jews, and especially this uh, Surah, uh, Surah to Sajda, look at this and look at that and look at these signs of Allah. Look at those signs of Allah. Don't you still believe? Look how Allah uh, sends rain down when there's nothing. The parched desert suddenly brightens up suddenly blooms and all these flowers come out and the animals come out and everything is happy and spring and and that lasts for many months and there's life and there's all sorts of activity going on until it dries and becomes dry again and there's just dust and sand and nothing else and then rain comes again and then everything suddenly comes to life again and stirs to life and um, the rivers swell up and the animals come from here there and everywhere birds come from all directions and they come and live there so this repeats itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us. Look, if Allah can do this, something dead, like a desert, Allah can give it life and then make it die again and then bring it back to life and then make it die again. Can that Allah not do that to you humans as well? One day you will die and then Allah will bring you back to life again. So he's giving this example. And then corruption appears because of what man himself has worked, what humans have done. That is corruption. And we will come to that as well. Look, man. Uh, gives advice to his son firstly about the heat and then good treatment to one's parents even if they are disbelievers remember what i mentioned before that there are four ayat in the quran that are specific to um obedience to allah and obedience to parents so disobedience to allah and disobedience to parents is mentioned in the same ayah here it's you could say close together where sayyidina luqman he is advising his son first about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worshiping only allah and then also uh, respecting and honoring his parents even if they are not muslim but in actual fact, indirectly, he is advising all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually advising us through Luqman, him teaching his son to all of us. Because Luqman, he was a mawahid. He was not a mushrik, he was a mawahid. And so him teaching his son, you know, uh, respect your parents and obey them even if they are mushrik, how can that make sense? 
So we understand from that that he's actually telling us. And then the qualities of the believer and the most significant qualities that lead man to leadership in the field of religion are patience and certitude. Patience and being certain, yaqeen as they call it. Um, it says in the, right, right at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, and in the Akhirah, they have certain beliefs. They have certitude. They have definite belief. They don't just think that oh, maybe there's an Akhirah. Maybe after I die, there's a life. No. They are certain. 100% certain. There is no chance that there is no life after death. Because life after death is certain. It will happen. Why? Allah has said it. Rasulullah said it. All the prophets and messengers have said it. And then the mothers of the believers are just like our mothers. This is 33.6. And the Battle of Ahzab is described depicting the state of the believers and the hypocrites as well as the severity of jihad. Okay, jihad is going to be very severe. It's not easy. You have to put a lot into it. You know, those people who are, they were just a handful against a mighty armies. And yet, though a handful of believers, they defeated those huge armies. How? All because of belief. Certitude again and patience. And the Battle of Ahzab is one of those. SubhanAllah, it's, it's uh, just thinking about Battle of Ahzab it makes your spine tingle. It makes the hair at the back of your neck stand on end because it's scary. You are at home and you've got so many ar around you full of, you know, anger and arm to the teeth about to attack you, about to just walk right across. Medina, this was their plan, walk right across Medina, leave nothing in Medina. There would be no Medina, it would be, the entire city would be wiped off the, the face of the planet. That was their plan. So we are going to go through a, a breakdown of this just now, okay? Uh, certain ayat, uh, not entirely all of them, but certain ayat as much as we can, inshallah. Uh, here, where, uh, where we start off, Surah Al Ankabut, which is uh, Surah, 20, uh, Surah 29, from verses 45 to 52, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is mentioning the refutation of some, some objections of the Ahlul Kitab. So, the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and Christians, they had certain objections against the Prophet, وسلم, against the Quran, against Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has refuted them. And Allah has also advised Muslims, look, if you want to speak to these Ahlul Kitab, you should speak to them in a different way compared to how you speak to the Mushrikun. It should be in a different way. Uh, the con your conduct should be different. Why? Because they are already halfway there. You don't want to put them off or, you know, totally. So there is some commonality anyway. So we have a common ground. Because of that common ground, we should have some leniency. And then Surah 29, 56 to 60. Command to migrate and promise of provision. So Allah SWT is also saying that, look, you know, if, if uh, you are finding it difficult, then Allah's earth is spacious. Allah will provide you risk wherever you go. So Allah is saying that if you find it difficult to practice your deen and you want to, or you think that is better for you to migrate and practice your deen there, then do that. But Allah says, I promise provision. Allah is Khairul Razakin. He said, I promise you that you will get your provision wherever it is written. And then verses 61 to 65, the proof of Tawheed and that Allah is a creator and the provider. So this is a, it's a huge promise here. And then verses... Uh, 66 to 68, the ingratitude of the Quraysh, despite the blessing that they have of the holy sanctuary and the Kaaba. You see the Quraysh of Makkah, they had the Kaaba there. They had Makkah. And people used to come as, for pilgrimage to the Kaaba from everywhere. Yet still they were ungrateful. It was because of the Kaaba that people, you see, just, just look at Makkah, Makkah, look at the mountains. No grass, no vegetation, nothing around there. Where do they get their food from? Where do, would they grow crops? Very few places around Makkah were fertile enough for crops to grow. Very few trees around Makkah would bear fruit. Other than that, it was dry, hard, harsh, black rock. You know, black rock is the most strongest form of and toughest form of rock. You put your foot on it and you can cut yourself. So that is what Makkah is really. It's just rock. There are very few places that were fertile or that provided uh, food. So where did they get this food from? It was the people who used to come to uh, the Kaaba with offerings and they used to bring food with them and they used to sell it to the Makkans. And then the people of Makkah, the Quraysh especially and other tribes as well, they used to purchase from them 
And sometimes, they, you know, when they used to go on trade, like Surah uh, Quraysh is revealed for that purpose. The ilaf of Quraysh, ilaf in rihlat al-shita'i was safe. So um, in in the summer, they used to go north to Syria, and in the winter, they used to go south to Yemen. And that trade, okay, carried them. Makkah was in the middle. So it was easier for them. And people used to come from Syria to trade, and go to Yemen. And people used to come from Yemen and stop at Makkah and go to Syria. So in all ways, Makkah was a focal point. It was a central point because of the Kaaba. Because of the Kaaba. And yet the Quraysh, they were showing signs of ingratitude. They were not uh, grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all those blessings. And then uh, verse 69, Allah says he will help those who work for his cause. Work for Allah's cause, Allah will help you. You see so many ulama and shuyuk and aima around us throughout the world. They've given up everything. They've given up the dunya. You see so many people, okay, they have degrees in law and psychology and and, uh, and so many other you know, departments that they've, they've uh, excelled. Yet they've given up everything and they want to be aima. They want to be imams. They want to be ustad. They want to be teachers. They want to help spread the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many people have done that. And alhamdulillah, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them risk, provided them risk from everywhere. I mean, just look at this course, for example. It's being provided free by the admin, free of charge. It does have its costs. It does have its costs. Yet we've known that people, I don't know who they are, yeah, but people have contributed for their own, from their own selves in their thousands, in thousands, uh, contributed, saying that you're providing a free course, um, I, I want to contribute this much to it. Because there are the, the shiuf and this, that, the other and other facilities that are being provided. So Alhamdulillah. So Allah is saying, and this is Allah's promise, that Allah says that if you work for his cause, Allah will provide. Allah will provide. And then we go on to the next surah, uh, 1 to 7, um, glad tidings of the victory for the Romans and the Muslims. So Romans, again, the Byzantines, uh, the Byzantines they're from the um, uh, Emperor of Byzantium, Eastern Roman Empire, they had a battle or a, a number of battles with the, the Persians who were Mushrik. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned that although they've lost, but they will win. They will defeat the, the Mushrikeen. We'll come back to that, like I mentioned before. And then verses 8 to 29 proves for the hereafter and Tawheed. We know that Tawheed is the prime message that came to us from all the prophets and messengers. And here, the hereafter is something that keeps us on our toes. So if someone uh, tells you of a punishment, okay, that if you drive through a red light, then that will keep us on our toes and will keep us careful that we do not drive through a red light. A challenge to the polytheists and inviting them to accept Islam. So these challenges are there and they're still there. But it's up to the polytheists to accept them. Allah is not forcing them. Why? Because if they are forced, then where is the reward? And then um, the same surah 46 to 60 proofs for Tawheed and the hereafter encouragement for adopting patience. So those people who adopt patience, Allah subhanahu is encouraging them that there's going to be so much reward for them. In Allah sabirin, Wallahu sabirin. So many times throughout the Quran, Allah saying, patience, 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 and you will get your reward. And then Allah subhanahu wa says in the next surah, uh, saying, um, words of wisdom are the best. Talking about the words of wisdom, hikmah, hakim. Allah SWT, he talks about the Quran as Hakim. He talks about his beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Hakim. He also mentions himself as Al Hakim, wise wisdom, somebody full of wisdom, and or providing wisdom like Allah. And Luqman Al Hakim. Luqman was a wise man, and talks about him with his name mentioned here. And then we move on and say Tawheed and the knowledge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that nothing can be compared to Allah. Allah starts with Tawheed and he says, look, if you cannot beat the knowledge of Allah. Then you might as well give up and believe in the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then next surah, surah uh, the first 15 verses, introduction to the Quran, introduction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to nature and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look around you, look at all this nature, look around you, you cannot even um, you know, weather a storm. One human cannot weather, well not one human, you got a thousand humans standing in the middle of a wilderness in the, on the moors, where it is freezing cold and the storm comes, how many of them are actually going to really survive? They will think about, use their aqal, use the intellect Allah has given them to survive, but how many of them will really survive and come out dry, come out winners? And then uh, Allah mentioned belief in the, in the Quran and the hereafter. So he's challenging the people who disbelieve in the hereafter that, come on, you, know, you cannot even bring anything equal to the Quran. So why are you 
just believe in the hereafter. If you can, if people believe that, oh yeah, this thing in the Quran is true because nobody else has said it, nobody else has done it. So if they can believe in that thing in the Quran, they should believe in the hereafter because the Quran speaks about the hereafter again and again and again. And then finally, the battle of Al Ahzab, the traits of the hypocrites, and the battle of the Banu Uraiba. Now, the Al Ahzab is a plural of Hizb, which means group, and there were lots of groups, lots of um, armies that got together in order to um, annihilate, to walk over Medina Munawwar. But they lost. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them lose. And also, the traits of the hypocrites within Medina. There were so many who were hypocrites and they tried to cause harm to the Muslims inside Medina. And then the battle of Banu Quraida, because they went against the Muslims, they tried to harm Muslims inside Medina, whilst that they were trying to, whilst the Muslims were defending Medina from the Ahzab. But let's go into certain, some ayat of the Quran um, and go a little bit depth into that. Okay, it's not possible to go into all of them. There's so many ayat, we can go on and on talking about them, but uh, they are just, just, a lot, you could say. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, let's look at Surah Al Rum. This is Surah number thirty of the Quran, and it falls within Jews number twenty-one. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala He says here, Alif Lam Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat Al Rum fi Adn Al Ardi wa Hum Mim Baadi Alayhim wa Mim Mim Baadi Ghalabihim Sayyaglibun fi Bidi Aysinin. This particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, look, if you look at the translation, and just look specifically at the yellow bit. Alif Lam means the Romans were defeated in the land nearby, but they will win after this defeat of theirs within a few years. Within a few years. Now, they hadn't won. What happened was that in Makkah Mukarramah, um, you see, the Mushrikun, who believed in more than one God, worship idols and everything, they favored the Persians who were also Mushrikun. And the Muslims believed in one God, one Allah, and they favored the, Byzant the Byzantines, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, the people who believed in one God. Because they were Christians, they believed in one God. So Muslims were favoring them. There was a battle that took place, and lots of other skirmishes as well. In, and in this particular battle, the Romans, they lost. And the Mushrikun, the Persians, they won. So the Mushrikun of Makkah, they said to the Muslims of, see, just like they... Those Persians, Mushrikun, they beat your friends, the Romans, those that you are supporting, we are going to beat you as well. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq Ta'ala who felt very sort of uh, heartbroken and very uh, upset that the, the polytheists had defeated the, the Mawahidun, the uh, monotheists in, uh, in Syria. This is where the battle took place. It was Syria. So part of it was under the uh, Persian Empire, part of it under the Roman Empire. So along the border, there was always skirmishes. So sometimes the Persians would take over, sometimes the Romans would take over, sometimes the Persians. So this like pendulum kept um, moving you know, to and fro. So on this occasion, the Persians had won. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu, he went over uh, after, after this ayah was revealed. You see, the, the Muslims were disheartened, and this ayah was revealed, and they were very happy. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu, he went over to the, the Persian, uh, to the uh, Mushrikun, and he says, guess what? Only after a few years, we are going to win. We are going to win. And so he had, and, and the Mushrikun just said, no, how can you use one, you know, you can't win. You can't win, okay? And then so he had a, con he had, a, he went into a bet, okay? A bet. You know, those days, betting was permissible before it became haram. With Ubay ibn Khalaf. He said to Ubay ibn Khalaf, look, if within the next few years, within the next three years, the, poly, the, the Persians, the polytheists, they win, I will give you 10 camels. But if the Romans win, you give me 10 camels. Ubay ibn Khalaf said, that, that, that's fine. He went back to, uh, to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, this is why I've said to Ubay ibn Khalaf uh, because of this ayah. And the Prophet sallam, said, no, you've agreed with them three years because this is between three and nine. Go back. And say no, not three years. Extend it, extend it to nine years, and change the conditions of that bet. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu and went back to Abu Ibn Khalaf and he said to him, "Okay, let's extend it to nine years. Give us a chance." He said, "Okay, but the camels are not going to be ten; they will be one hundred. So if the Persians win, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu will have to 
give 100 camels to Ubayy ibn Khalaf. If the Romans win, Ubayy ibn Khalaf will have to give 100 camels to Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. So what happened was, within a few years, this was during the Battle of Badr, the news came to the Muslims that the Romans have won. They had defeated the polytheists of Persia. And so Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, he went to the sons of Ubayy ibn Khalaf because Ubayy ibn Khalaf had died then. And he took those 100 camels from them and he said, this is a bet I had with your father. And he brought them to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, give them out as sadaqah. Why? Because betting has been declared haram in Islam. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala who gave them out as sadaqah in that sense. So between, so uh, bidah on here, look at the word bidah on ba, ba, ayn, that means between three and nine. It's any number between three and nine. It can mean three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And nine, and this is according to the sayings of, of many commentators of the Quran and many others. So the Prophet so Sina Abu Bakr Siddiq Radiallahu Anhu, he originally agreed three years, but Sina uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said increase it to you know, more than that and take it to nine years. So that's what uh, they did. So the Muslims at that time, Subhanallah, look at this: the day the Muslims defeated. That was 17th of Ramadan. The day the Muslims defeated the Mushrikun of, uh, of uh, Makkah at Badr, that very same day, the Muslims got the news that the uh, one God worshippers, the Mawahidun, the monotheists, the Christians of Rome, had defeated the polytheists of Persia. The very same day. So there was two good news, two glad tidings for the Muslims on the same day. And next we move on to another one I wanted to talk about. The Habu Fasad, yes. I'll come to the questions at the end if I have time to try. Somebody's asking a question. Another ayah is Zahr al Fasad, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Zahr al Fasad of Il Badri will Bahm. Bima Kasabat Aid in Nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this entire world in balance and equal. But he mentions here that facade, destruction, corruption, trouble, mischief, war, all these bad things that happen around the world, unless they are an act of nature, everything else, it happens because they mark us about aiding us with what people have done, what people have done with their own hands, what people do themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is saying that the prevailing of bad is the people's fault. It's the people's fault. So if there is bad in this world among humans, among people, then it is the people's fault. Allah has created this whole universe in balance. The sun, moon, they don't crash into each other. The planets don't crash into each other. Nothing happens that affects us directly or indirectly. But why is it that it happens here on earth? Somebody does something in one part of the world, it affects everybody else around the world. Why? Because this facade comes from the people. Facade, it can mean lots of things. It can mean corruption at a uh, high scale or at a low scale. A person can be corrupt within the family. One person within family could be corrupt or uh, thousands of people within the in, entire country can be corrupt. One person within the ummah can be corrupt and uh, lots of people within the Ummah can be corrupt. I'm talking about Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. Okay, corruption is among humans. It, it is uh, uh, religion neutral, basically. It goes across the board, everybody, you know, all humans. Allah says in the Quran, Bimaka Sabbat Aidin Nas, people's hands, not all humans' hands. It's, the, it's what people do. So if if you, uh, uh, um, you are not getting your right from the government, then there is facade. If you are not getting... Uh, your rights from your local council, for example, that is facade. If you are not getting your rights from your religious leaders, that is facade. If you are not getting your uh, rights from your family, that is facade. It's facade is all manners, all sorts of ways. Like uh, inheritance, for example, one of the first types of knowledge that is going to be lifted up is a knowledge of inheritance. And when knowledge of inheritance is lifted up, people don't want to give inheritance. Those people who are in charge, they have the inheritance, they have the money. They just don't want to give it out. That is facade. It happens. This happens. I had this particular question today uh, from someone, and that's why I thought I'd mention it because that is facade as well. So I told them to watch this particular lecture on YouTube or on Facebook Live because I'm going to be 
hinting towards it because this facade is because of the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us laws. If we follow them, there will be no facade coming from humans. Maybe in nature there's destruction and stuff like that, but that's a, a course that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predetermined for us all. But this particular facade that comes from humans, it must be dealt with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, uh, Allah says, look, if you just follow the laws that Allah has given to us, because, you know, we are like, uh, we humans, let's just say, we are humans are like Argos furniture or like Ikea furniture. We humans are all flat packed. We humans are all flat packed. We are Ikea furniture. In order for us to be assembled and to uh, function properly, we have to follow the instructions on the manual to assemble us and how to look after ourselves. And if we follow that, if you follow that flat pack manual, you will be able to um, assemble that shelf properly and the uh, shelves will not be wonky. It won't be like that diagonal and they won't fall over. So that's us. Our life is like that. Okay, We have to follow that manual and that manual is the Quran and further instructions are in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu so there's facade in this world. It is because the Markasabat aid in Nas, what the people's hands have done. You know, some people asked me, um, one person asked me long ago when I was um, when I went to a particular church for a talk, and they said, Why is there so much trouble in the world? If God really loves us, why is there so much trouble in the world? Why are people killing each other? Why is there so much so many wars and things? I said, Because people want wars. Allah does not want war, because people want corruption. And those people who want corruption, they are the ones who are corrupt. And that is why there is bad things around the world. If people all got together and they rooted out this corruption and these bad things around the world, everything will be fine. But it's us. We humans ourselves are corrupt. And that is why we there's uh, all this trouble in the world. It's not because Allah is loving us or not loving us. Allah loves us all the time. Allah loves us all the time. But Allah would love it that if we actually work things out according to his laws and according to his teachings as uh, was taught to us by the previous uh, prophets and apostles and by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also I mentioned that it's also a test for us. If there are poor people living in our neighborhood, what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to ignore them or are we going to help them? But these bad things come about because of what we do. Don't blame Allah for that. And don't blame shaitan either. Shaitan just pushed the idea into our heart, but we are the one who implement whatever bad things he wants us to do. May Allah protect us all from him. And then I was going to mention something else, but I think uh, we're going to be short of time. So let's go straight into this one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us this example of Luqman. Who was Luqman? He was, was he a prophet or was he just a pious person? According to most uh, scholars, he was just a pious person. He was not a, a prophet. And there's a hadith of that mentioned in uh, Tafsir of Imam Al-Qurtubi as well, Alihi Rahma. That Luqman, Alihi Rahma, he was not a prophet. He was just a very pious person. And he was so good, that so pious, that people used to give examples of him. And why does Allah give example of Luqman in the Quran? It is because the people of Makkah knew about Luqman. He knew that Luqman was a very pious person who lived in the past. A lot of people say that he actually lived in Africa. He was an African, but his uh, legendary stories were worldwide. Everybody knew about him. So Allah is giving this example of Luqman. Look at Luqman. He was very Hakim. He was a very wise person. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions straight away that this uh, Luqman, that he was thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he worshipped one God. He was not a polytheist. So the polytheists of Mecca, they knew about Luqman, yet they used to, you know, give examples of him and stories from his, um, you know, the legends that have been passed down to them. But Allah says he still believed in one God. Why don't you? Why don't you? So Allah is challenging them. But if you look at the wisdom that he had, he was such a wise person in his family, outside his family, all his neighborhood. In, time, in fact, all the people that came around, they wanted to visit and Luqman and they wanted to take some gems of wisdom from him. People used to come to him far far and wide just to uh, take some knowledge from him. He was such a wise person. And in this Quran, he is giving advice to his son about uh, many, many things, about many things. So we just don't have the time to speak about all them. I'd love to, but uh, we just cannot. So we have to um, mention briefly that the wisdom that Allah has given to Luqman 
That wisdom obviously came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the wisdom that is mentioned in the Quran and it is the wisdom that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving to us as well. If you can accept the wisdom that Luqman is giving to his son, why don't you accept the wisdom that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving to the whole of humanity? If you can believe in Luqman that you've never met, but you heard your parents and your grandparents and great grandparents generation after generation mentioning Luqman that he was a very wise person and his wisdom has passed down to us through the ages if you can believe in him you have Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in front of you in front of you in your midst why don't you take wisdom from him he has come to you as rahmatan lil alameen So there's so much. The hikmah, what, what does it mean? Hikmah according to uh, Sayyidina Ibn Abbas ta'ala, and who I'll mention this only just so as a reference purpose. He said it means al-aql, wal-fahm, wal um, wal fatana. It means uh, intelligence, it means understanding, and it means insight, inner knowledge, inner knowledge. Very few people have got inner knowledge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, a, a true believer has inner knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, Be very afraid of the inner sight or insight, inner knowledge of the believer because he sees with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that hikmah was given to Sayyidina Luqman, who was just a wise person. We have wise people in the ummah of the greatest Prophet ﷺ. The greatest prophet, imagine how much hikmah they will have. And among those uh, types of hikmah that uh, Luqman told his son, one was, which is very appropriate for us, waqsid fi mashika waqdud means so thick. Keep your, the way you walk, keep that moderate. And the way you speak, keep that soft. So the way you walk has to be nice, polite. Don't walk around like, you know, like you're, you're about to beat someone up all the time. Yeah. And don't talk, talk like you're going to you know, destroy the world or about to declare war or something. Keep your walking in a solemn, polite, soft manner. And keep your talking also in a soft, polite manner. And this is one of the, hukima, uh, the hikmahs that Luqman told his son. Why? Because then he gives an example. In the Ankar al-Aswati la al-Hamid. The worst type of sound that comes out is the sound of the donkey. It's the sound of a donkey. I mean, just imagine you're sitting in your garden or out in the field, in the meadows, soaking up the sun, and it's not Ramadan, say, and you're having your your lemonade or whatever, or a cup of tea or whatever, and you have a nice, calm atmosphere. Birds are singing. Everything is nice and calm. Nice breeze. You can smell the blossom. Oh, subhanAllah. Everything is nice and calm. And all of a sudden, you hear the sound of a donkey braying. How are you going to feel? Just imagine. I mean, I don't want to take this in a funny way, but there is some funny aspect to it. However, just imagine everything is nice and calm in your family. And all of a sudden, you get this person turning up, whether it's your family or not, friend or not, whoever it is, who's got the worst character, who's got the worst way of speaking. So imagine that and, and this example that we've just given in Aswati Hamid. The worst type of sounds is the braying of the donkey. Allah is through Luqman is giving us this example of the people when they walk, people when they talk, when if they are good, they will not walk or talk like donkeys do. And then the last one, subhanAllah. Um well, just before this one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Anna awla bil min that, the believe, uh, that the Prophet sallallahu is closer to the believers than their own selves. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is closer to you. There's a hadith as well. Anna jaleesu man salla aliyya. anhu alayhi salatu wa salam mentioned in Mishkat al that I, that when somebody says salawat upon me, when someone said uh, salatu wa salam to me, I am jaleesu, I'm sitting right next to him. Jalis means companion, someone who sits next to you. So just imagine you just say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Yusayi wa And imagine that the Prophet is sitting right next to you. So here it says, An Nabi awla bil mu'mineena min anfusin. That's the ayah just before this one on the slide, okay? 
So the Prophet وسلم, is closer to the believers than their own selves. Than their own selves. And then this ayah, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٍ حَسَنًا Anywhere you look, any way you look, any in any form you look, you will find nobody better than Prophet Muhammad وسلم, because you have, you certainly have an excellent role model to follow in Allah's Messenger Muhammad There is nobody better, we know that. There is nobody better. In any way, physically, psychologically, spiritually, in any way whatsoever. Nobody better than Rasulullah. We present heroes to our children. We say, oh, look at this and look at that. Which hero should we be giving to them that will make them successful in this world and the next? Muhammad Rasulullah. People are looking, I mean, especially kids, they look for heroes in actors, they look for heroes in football players and other sports personalities. They look for heroes when they grow up in politicians, in, in business people. They look for heroes in, Allah forbid, in gangsters. Astaghfirullah. Temporary success of a few days. It just goes. And then what? Which hero, which emulation is going to help you in this world and the next? And that is the role model of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. There is no role model greater than him. Never has been, never will be. And we have that role model. We are a very fortunate ummah. That ummah that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Sayyidina Musa alayhi wa sallam, wa alayhi salatu wa sallam, he was proud of. He saw, he was climbed up the mountain and he saw so many followers, so many followers up, up to where he could see. He said, Ya Allah, who are these? Who are these people I can see? And Allah said, these are the followers of the last messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. So that is the status that the followers get. But we will only get that real status in the akhirah if we follow the messenger Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved and the beloved of Allah and the beloved of all. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٍ حَسَنًا It is in the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have the best perfect and most perfect role model to follow. As a husband, he's the best. As a cousin, as a brother, as a brother to his cousins, he was like a brother. To his friends, he was like a brother. As a statesperson, as a, uh, a politician, as a uh, dignitary, as a tradesman, in any shape, way, form, you look, he's perfect. I know we are not perfect. We make mistakes all of the time. So we should always aspire to be like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and one question, one thing I'd like to mention to our sisters who are not married yet, uh, and also those who are married as well. Someone asked me this question a few days ago about married partners, this, that, they're looking for, this, that. And I, I told them, I said, look, do not look for perfection in any man. And any per, uh, boy or man who's looking to get married, do not look for perfection in any woman. Only Rasulullah sallallahu was perfect. Nobody else is perfect. Everybody has their flaws and, de and deficiencies. So when you find someone, if you married someone, or if you're already married, always try and improve your relationship, improve the family atmosphere. Why? Because I've known people that they've left their husband, divorced, khola, whatever, yeah, or the husband has divorced his wife and married someone else, and they have found out that the person that they were married to previously was better than this one. So the person that they married now is no better than the one they were already married to. So why go through all, the, all that hassle? Do not look for perfection. Look for how uh, much religion is in that person, how good that person is, and that's it. You will not find... Per Nobody is going to be perfect. I mean, how many people do we know has prayed five times prayers every single day for the last one year? For the last one year, five prayers on time every single day. Let alone in the masjid, even on their own. So we, we won't find perfection everywhere. Only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is perfect. We should aspire to be, alike, to be like him, though we know we will not be like him. Always look for his role, role model. Always look for what he did, what he said in certain circumstances, and can we apply them in our circumstances as well. So uh, time is uh, up by a number of minutes. I'm going to end that, inshallah. Uh, and those from on social media and YouTube, I think it's our farewell here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.